Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Annie E. Casey Foundation webinar co-hosted with the Center for Urban Families. Uh, today's event is titled Supporting Young Fathers, Lessons from the Field. If you experience uh, any technical difficulties today, uh, visit the link that you see on the screen or send a note in the chat to the host. That's me, Tim Sandville. You can also call WebEx tech support at the number you see on the screen. At any time during the webinar, you can submit questions to presenters using the Q&A window. Um, the Q &A, make sure that the Q&A icon, which you can see depicted on the slide, is blue. If it isn't, click the icon and the Q&A window should appear. Um, I just wanted to note, I, I think that we are having a little bit of issues with the Q&A function. So if you want to submit questions via the chat, if the Q&A is not working, then, then please do so. And just make sure you send it to either all hosts or all presenters. Um, excuse me, all attendees. Um, you know, and finally, I just want to let you guys know that this recording is, this webinar is being recorded and we'll make the recording available on our website at some point soon. I'm going to send it over now to Quinique Fullard, our moderator for today's webinar. Thanks, Tam. Can we forward to the, the next slide here? So my name is Quinique Fullard with the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of the foundation, I want to welcome all of you joining today. We have nearly 400 folks registered to, register to join us. Um, this is exciting as it, as it confirms the importance and timeliness of the conversation. Today's webinar will highlight findings from a new brief on promising strategies to support young fathers of color. We have a 50 minute program plan today. We'll start with an overview of what you can expect to learn along with introductions of our panelists. From there, we will dig into the brief, which was released today by the Center for Urban Families to walk through its key findings. We will then share some exciting work that we are launching in the fall related to young fathers. And we'll leave plenty of time to answer your questions before we close out. So as Tim stated, please submit your questions via the chat box. Can we go to the next slide, please? Today, I am joined by three expert panelists, as you can see on slide five. I'd like to invite them to introduce themselves and say a word about your role. Let's start with Joe first, then Charles, and then Sheldon will bring us home. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Thanks for taking time out of your schedules. I am Joe Jones, founder and CEO of the Center for Urban Families in Baltimore. I first like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Anthony Barnes, whose picture graces the cover of the report that you'll have a chance to see uh, at, your, at your leisure, but did want to acknowledge him. And to say that the mission of the Center for Urban Families is to uh, help fathers and families achieve stability and economic success with a, a mantra to dismantle poverty, uh, an additional focus on training, technical assistance, and, and policy advocacy. Thank you all for joining us today. Good afternoon. My name is Charles Daniels. I'm the co-founder of Fathers Up. This is the country's first outpatient mental health and substance abuse treatment facility for fathers and their families. I'm glad to be here with you all today. Hello, everyone. My name is Sheldon Smith. I am the founder and executive director of a great organization called the Dovetail Project, serving young fathers throughout the city of Chicago between the ages of 17 and 24. I want to thank the NEE Casey Foundation and the Center for Urban Families for having me today as a guest panelist, and I'm looking forward to speaking to you all. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for introducing yourself. Looking forward to this panel. Um, so here's what we will accomplish today. First, I want to tell you about the Foundation's investment in young fathers. Those who are familiar with the Casey Foundation know that we have been funding two-generation strategies for more than a decade. Moving forward, we're going deeper into the needs of young parents. We are supporting strategies to help them navigate the transition into adulthood and achieve economic stability. We also want to support young parents as they improve their ability to meet the needs of their children. As I mentioned, the Center for Urban Families released a new report focused on young fathers of color. We view fathers as essential to driving two generation success. Both common sense and research shows that fathers play a critical role in the development of their children, whether they live together or not. Yet young fathers, particularly those of color, are often left out of the conversation. Program, policy, and systems are often ill-equipped to serve them. The good news is that there are organizations who prioritize the needs of young fathers. We will talk about strategies these organizations are adopting 
to recruit and engage this population, as well as some opportunities to stress support. Can we please have that? With that overview in mind, let's jump into the report and hear from our practitioners. So this report is the final product in a year-long process. Um, the Center for Urban Families started as, around this time last year and with the support of the Casey Foundation, it worked to identify 10 organizations from across the country. These organizations have an intentional focus on young fathers. They reflect a diverse set of models and mixes of services. They're geographically diverse, including rural representation. Most are led by men of color and some are led or co-founded or were co-founded by women of color. Um, CFUF then partnered with Dr. Clinton Boyd Jr., a postdoc researcher at Duke University, to conduct interviews with the organization. Um, our original plan was to host a one and a half day in-person roundtable in Baltimore, um, but COVID-19 hit, and like many of you, we quickly pivoted to the virtual environment. In late spring, the 10 organizations and a small cohort of young fathers logged into Zoom for a multi-hour conversation. And I must admit that I was surprised by how well the roundtables turned out. There was not a moment of silence on the call. And this was because the practitioners had such a large appetite to connect with each other, to share best practices, and to surface issues around what they are grappling with. Many, myself included, were disappointed that we had to end the Zoom session. CFUF did a wonderful job in capturing both the energy of the practitioners as well as their insights in this new publication. So I take this opportunity to give a special thank you to CFUF for releasing this valuable tool to the field. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge that our conversation did not happen in a vacuum. The practitioners understood the implications of COVID-19 on the lives of the young dads in their program. They are actively tweaking their models to continue to serve young fathers. We will spend some time during this webinar to tease this out. Please event. So we heard two themes about the so we heard two themes about the strength of young fathers. They want to be good dads and they have great potential. And speaking on their potential, practitioners acknowledge that young fathers are grappling. And speaking on their potential, the practitioners acknowledge that young fathers are in a critical stage of development. They are transitioning to adulthood and figuring out work and education. This is the period that defines their future earnings trajectory. This is importantly, we're learning from rapid developments in brain science that these are emerging adult years, or the period between adolescent and the early 20s, are what scientists call a second surge. These are the years in which they develop executive skills, which make it possible for people to set goals, regulate impulses, overcome adversity, succeed in school, be consistent and reliable on the job, and basically find their place in the world. Young fathers are also raising young children who are in a critical stage of their own development. Here, we know that the first years of life are a period of incredible growth in all areas of the baby's development. The parent-child bond and positive child-rearing behaviors are important. Equally so, our basic income and resources to meet the infant and toddler's nutritional and health needs. If we combine these two, the young adult parent's development and his child's development, then there is a clear connection here. How well the young person does economically, how much stress they hold, because parental stress affects attachment, all of this sets the context for the infant and toddler they raise. The organizations also emphasize how fatherhood can motivate men. At this point, I'd like to pose a question to Joe to dig a little bit into this point. Mm -hmm. Joe, your organization serves approximately 1,400 families annually. You also serve a broad range of men of color across Baltimore. As you built out the CFUF model, you invested in learning what motivates each participant and tailoring approaches to work with them. Can you tell us what you learned about what motivates 18 to 24 year old fathers? You know, young fathers have a range, and thank you for the question, Clinique, and the partnership with the Casey Foundation and the opportunity to work directly with you. But young fathers, you know, they have a range of needs and interests, and they often feel so disconnected because in our society, not many people knock on doors looking for young fathers uh, from a supportive standpoint. So the first thing that we know about them is they don't trust very easily. And so we have to create the, the, the conditions and the environment so that trust happens. And then recognizing that the complexity of their lives 
are not something that you can simply pull the you know the onion peels away from very easily it takes time you know you will get some information from them early on and over time as the relationship and the trust builds you get more and more you tend to get the whole story and then you can begin to think with them how to create a pathway uh, to success that is defined by their goals and interests but i'd like to to share a little bit in that context about a young man uh, who a young dad who came to the organization in early february uh, of this year uh, someone who was uh, with a criminal justice background, but still had interest. He wanted to be a great dad, uh, but he was in a very complex uh, relationship with his child's mother. Shortly after enrolling, uh, his his child's mother was incapacitated, and the public you know the public system stepped in, and he was given temporary custody. Uh, but it was very complex because they did not see him as the permanent caregiver, and he really had to fight you know for that space. Joining the fatherhood program gave him the opportunity to be in a support group with other young dads who had similar and other experiences where they began to bond with one another, share experiences, the trust began to build in the group, and he began to lean on his case manager, would also build a trust and relationship with him. And more and more of the, the elements of his journey began to come, uh, come through. And with that, he was able to work with his case manager create a goal plan that allowed him to work with the support and encouragement of his case manager to work through the custody issue. Uh, with that, he was able to move forward and get custody you know, of his daughter. Uh, and the, the beauty of that is that this is a, a support system that should be available to every dad in our country. Unfortunately, there are not as many programs in the country that mirror programs uh, for mothers or for uh, whole families, if you will. Uh, fast forward, uh, he also secured employment. Now, the support, the, the, even though we do workforce development, this is key around what partnerships mean. We actually partnered outside of the organization. He took advantage of support uh, to get into the labor market. And he actually said that his first attempt at employment, he was rejected because of his criminal record. But, for, you know, sometimes God step in, steps in and the employer who in, re rejected him suggested another place that he could go to to get support. And so with that, we encouraged him. He didn't go in, uh, immediately. He was, you know, his feelings were hurt. His confidence was shot, but he worked through that. And now he's fully employed. He has custody of his baby. And this is a young man who is a vital resource to his community and to his family. Thanks for sharing this story with us, Joe. Um, it is really inspiring, inspiring to hear about this young man's success um, and to learn that he has custody of his daughter and that he's able to improve his employment. And, um, and Quinnick, I just want to end with one thing and that, you know, because of the support that he's received and the mother has received, they began to develop the components of a co-parenting relationship so that the child does not get caught up into this disintegrated relationship, but they work together for the benefit of their, co their, their child and from a co-parenting standpoint and work that I'm really encouraged that the Casey Foundation is undertaking. Thanks, Joe. I think that's a really uh, important point to add to the conversation. Can we advance to the, the, the next slide, please? Um, you know, when, when Joe shared his story with us, um, one of the things that it brings to mind is forcing us to think about the other obstacles that young fathers face um, that often prevents them from succeeding. Um, the slide before us represents our understanding of the realities of the young fathers that are kind of disturbed. Um, this includes institutional biases and stigma, unfair targeting and harsh sentencing, history of violence and trauma that leads to mental health challenges, financial insecurity, and unstable housing. Um, I'd like to be very clear that these are the stressors they face as young men of color. They are also felt acutely in the lives of young fathers, affecting their ability to parent. I'd like to go deeper to, on this point by asking a couple of questions to our panelists. Charles, your organization emphasizes understanding someone's story, really seeing what happened before you met this person. This history defines how they see the world and walk through the doors. It also must be addressed to support them in securing and maintaining job opportunities. Can you unpack how this history also affects their parental experience? Sure, thank you, Cornick, for the question, and thank you, NE Casey Foundation, the Center for Urban Families, for allowing me to share my thoughts around such this important question. I can say firsthand that as a therapist, I know the value 
and power of a person's story. And typical questions that we ask ourselves at Fathers Uplift as servants prior to and while serving fathers are one, what's important to them as fathers, right? And two, how have they managed to continue to persevere despite everything they've gone through? We recognize there are barriers that they've experienced and we have to shed light on those barriers, right? We can all agree that everyone has a story. And as therapists, we value the power of the narrative. When you think about your own story for a second, you most likely are able to pinpoint the moments in your life that were integral to your development as a person, right? We all can say that. How you present yourself and the ways in which you view your life. The same is true for the dads that sit in your presence right across from you, specifically for black fathers. Racism and oppression is a part of their therapy. And failure to understand what role these factors play in their lives will result in an inability to engage and connect with them in a lasting and effective way, long after the curriculum and the interventions have played their role. When you have not read the story, you can't be an effective partner, and young fathers need you to understand their story. Mm -hmm. I carry the words of my mentor, Dr. Anthony Owens, with me wherever I go, and I remember him saying to me, Charles, people don't care what you know until they know that you care, right? Understanding their experiences from cover to cover as black and brown fathers navigate in a world where racism and oppression, toxic masculinity exists, plays a role in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis as young men and fathers. That in itself is taking the first step towards showing them that you care. And once you show them that you care, you will be willing and able mm -hmm. to understand their experiences um, as parents in this complex world with complex factors. Thank you, Sheldon. My apologies. Thank you, Charles. Um, Sheldon, the next question is for you. Um, the challenges listed on this slide were documented prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. For example, 18 to 24-year-old Black men often had low educational attainment and high employment unemployment rates. Latino men, while they had higher rates of employment, were often in low-wage jobs. This financial insecurity made it difficult for young fathers of color to provide for their children before COVID-19. My question to you would be, in what ways have you seen these challenges exacerbated by the pandemic? Thank you, Panique, for that excellent question. You know, what, what I would like for everyone out there to know is that many of our young men, particularly young men 17 to 24, uh, were already at a disadvantage in being profiled before COVID-19 took place. Many of us who are currently doing this work across the country know how hard it is for them to receive resources. Our young men already here in Chicago were making less than 2,500 a year with a 65% graduation rate to retain their GED or high school diploma. And now that COVID-19 has hit, we've seen young men mm -hmm. come to our relief fund to receive infamil, wipes, pampers, acts for employment, um, and looking for different ways to be back in into uh, trade schools so that they can support their families. With COVID-19 holding all of our young men back and, and just us looking at everything that's going on, this was happening before the protests, before everything that we see across the country. And so being able to now think about a lot of these highlights in COVID really shining the true light on young fathers to say, what resources do young dads have? Why aren't those resources there? And why are many of them still struggling across the country? And, and we know this to be just the, in the norm and the regular on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Sheldon. I um, really appreciate your insight as well as Charles' insight on the need to really connect with young dads. Um, you both raised a few issues that we may return to in the Q&A portion. Um, I also encourage our audience members to submit questions via the chat box. Uh, we will address them shortly. Can we move to the next slide? So the practitioners, the practitioners shared common insights about the most effective elements of their programs for young fathers. These approaches will be familiar to most folks on this webinar, as they are doing what we know to be best practices, but they prioritize young dads. For example, they recruit young fathers in the places that he often frequents. Staff often stand on street corners to pass out flyers or simply strike up a conversation. Many organizations have cultivated partnerships with other institutions, including juvenile facilities, sports, and schools. One of the things that really stuck out is the prominent use of images of young fathers and their children. 
This challenges the norm of having photos of moms only, and it allows the father to imagine himself in the program. Once the organizations connect with the young father, it then focuses on maintaining his engagement. It starts through the hiring of committed and relatable staff, some of whom were young fathers themselves. Another way they incentivize engagement is through culturally relevant programs and curriculum. Each of the organizations tailored their models to acknowledge the participant's age, race, and unique background. For example, a program that serves Latinos might account for cultural differences in fatherhood, language needs, or the realities of living in a mixed status family. To support them as dads, the organizations host activities such as movie nights or photo shoots to build the parent-child bond. Others provide gift cards and arrange back to school shopping sprees. At least one of the programs provided childcare. This may seem like a small gesture on the part of the organization, yet it allows the dad to fulfill the traditional role of provider and address the basic needs of his family. I should also mention that all the programs address the job and education needs of young dads. This was either through their direct model or in partnership with local organizations. Another thing the organizations agreed on was the importance of helping young fathers navigate systems and policies. As mentioned, young fathers are often involved in the, may be involved in the criminal justice system or the family court and the child support system or seeking access to safety net programs. Yet these systems can be intimidating and can unintentionally ignore or actively harm young fathers. These organizations actively educate young fathers on their rights and serve as advocates to help the dad navigate the problem process. Charles, Fathers Up NIF prioritizes relationship building between staff and fathers, and also amongst the fathers themselves. What role does this activity, this trust building, play in the effectiveness of your work? And what happens if you do not invest in that trust building? Thank you, Kwanik. We look at trust building as the heartbeat of working with young fathers, right? Um, we define trust building as your ability to place yourself in the shoes of that father who is sitting before you. It is impossible to engage a father if one is unable to check their own definition of who and what, the, what a father is to them, understand that the experiences of black and brown fathers is not normal and as such cannot be compared to white fathers. Black and brown fathers' experiences aren't the same, which means your expectations given what they experience when working with them should be checked at all times while taking into consideration the effects of racism and oppression. And an attempt to place yourself in the shoes of the other person, please note that every black father's experience is not the same, so trust building will look a little bit different, right? Also, as white providers, you do not have to be black to empathize and understand where they are coming from, right? So what may appear easy to you, to these fathers that we are serving, black and brown young fathers, will most likely be not, be, may not be easy to that father, right? I can't express this enough, be mindful of how we are viewing them in relation to their ability to grasp concepts, skills, and learn a new technique, et cetera, right? An example which we see all the time while we're engaging with child welfare workers is that fathers, when they have their children removed to them, should act normal and should not be angry or frustrated, right? Placing yourself in, your, in their shoes is saying, you know what, what if my child was removed from me? Would I be able to be normal? Would I be able to show up to appointments on a regular basis? Nine times out of 10, no, you would not. You would probably be in severe distress or depressed, right? That's an example of placing yourself in the father's shoes. And what we realize also when working and establishing this trust building with black and brown fathers that is that self-disclosure is very important. We cannot expect young fathers to share and give and be extremely authentic when we are unwilling to share ourselves, right? So be mindful when we are developing trust. But at Fathers Uplift, we value self-disclosure and we value the ability to say, you know what? We are not going to project our own definitions of what fathers should be onto that father. We are going to explore their story and listen and empathize and self-disclose when necessary. Thank you, Cornique. Thank you, Charles. Sheldon, when the Dovetail Project started, you quickly understood that you could not adopt any existing fatherhood model to serve the young man in the South Side of Chicago. What key insights can you share about designing a model for a specific population? Quinique, I just want to thank you so much for this question, and you know I'm excited to answer it because when when we internally thought about developing the Dovetail Project curriculum, we really understood a few things, which is fatherhood is not. And fatherhood and family is not like employment, 
or workforce development. It's not like mentorship. It's not like any other program that you can put together. When you talk about family, you have to talk about culture. When you talk about culture, you have to understand that African-American families are different from Latino families, which are different from Asian families, which are different from white families, blue, green, and orange. And then that sets you off to understand that any and everything that you build needs to be culturally competent around the development. For many of our young men, when they got involved with some of the curriculum we were using in the beginning, it just, it didn't touch certain culture pieces. It didn't touch certain city pieces. You know, young men who are in your program are looking for something that is familiar to, to what they are experiencing right there in their city or in their state or in their community. And so we knew from the start that that would be important. The, the next piece on top of the curriculum, it's a, it's a combination of things. And the, the next part of the combination is having staff that looks like them, that, that, that understands the language that they speak, that understand the background that they're coming from. And then if you have the staff and you have a strong curriculum, you want to be able to bring them into picking the perfect location. A lot of people think you could just pick any location and tell young people to come, particularly fathers. The number one thing fathers are concerned about is, is, is safety. And if they feel unsafe, they won't come, they won't join, they won't be involved. But our um, evolution in developing curriculum was knowing that the fatherhood field was growing um, and it was, it was evolving and there were people who came along who, who pioneered new curriculum and brought it out. But we wanted to bring in a different angle to get the world to think about fatherhood in a cultural way and, and how to really support fathers and families from that way and not a one size fit all curriculum that, uh, that, that we force young people to adapt to knowing that it, it may have some faulty pieces in it uh, in supporting them in their local communities. Thank you, Sheldon. I really appreciate you emphasizing the importance of location. Um, Joe, these practices were developed prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. But as we practice social distancing, the needs of young fathers continue. Your organizations must continue to do the work. And your organizations must continue to do the work. Can you share any early learning about programming, about how programming must be guided during the time of COVID-19, and what opportunities does this moment present for young fathers? Wow, you know, <clears throat> that is such a huge and important question, Quinique. Five months ago, <clears throat> What Charles described, what Sheldon described, what I've mentioned is stuff that we were doing to address a population of young men of color who cared deeply about their families and communities in some very complex situation. And that was all pre-COVID. COVID hits and COVID was not something that you could anticipate or that there was a weather, uh, a weather person who predicted that a storm was coming. This hit and it was abrupt and it caused every segment of society to react in different ways. And it took us several weeks in terms of the Center for Urban Families before we could reset uh, our remote operations. Uh, we did that relatively quickly, but then we had to move from this direct touch, bringing young men from the community into a center where they had dedicated space that was no longer gonna be the reality. So we had to morph all of our programming, all of our touches to virtual programming, uh, using um, you know, platforms like all of us are, are familiar with today more so than ever. But there are also a set of other things that uh, became really acute and even more exasperating in terms of increased need for supports around food security, uh, substance abuse and mental health, rental assistance, utility assistance, all of these things were very, very critical at this time. And keep in mind, many of the fatherhood programs that we're talking about don't have budgets to address these needs, right? And so we depend on the, you know, the support of others, but we also have to do, you know, some practitioners are going into their pockets using their own finances because the needs in the community outweigh our ability to just think about our own, you know, our own financial uh, situation. Uh, the pandemic, many of the young fathers have been deeply impacted by unemployment and cuts needed uh, to, cuts to needed services. Many have mandatory child support orders and the debts owed uh, have hanging over their heads and they are constantly increasing. So just because COVID is there doesn't mean that they get some kind of deferral on child support. And the last thing that I'll mention, and it, it, it pains me to have to even bring this up, but you know, 
in the middle of a global pandemic, something none of us who are alive today have ever experienced before, we were very fortunate that our, our government came together and issued a set of uh, relief acts, in this case, the CARES Act. And the CARES Act, one of the, uh, one of the elements of the CARES Act was to provide economic relief to every income eligible American in the form of a stimulus check uh, in the amount of $1,200. Uh, even if you owe back student loan debt, you were eligible to receive that check. If you owe back taxes to Uncle Sam, you know, Uncle Sam never forgives anything. If you owe, you owe, and don't be late because you'll end up paying a penalty. Well, in this case, in a pandemic, for some reason, we decided that if you were a young father or a father who owed state owed child support, meaning money that was going back to the state, not to the, not to the family or to the child's mother, you were not eligible to receive a stimulus check. These are the kind of conditions that we are dealing with. And just think about one example of how that could play out negatively in community, right? If you're a young dad who depends on those resources to be able to pay for the place where you have shelter and you're no longer able to do it, you may have to double or triple up in a home and further expose other folks to the coronavirus. So it's really important that we think about this in the broader terms of issues that impact uh, young fathers in general, but more so as we look at this acute issue caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you, Joe. I, I really appreciate you digging into this, and I, I am betting we will have a lot of questions um, to go further in a Q&A session. Um, can we move to the next slide? So as can be expected, um, the organizations had a list of policy and practice recommendations. Um, these recommendations would allow them to work more effectively, as well as boost opportunity for young fathers of color. I'd like to ask Joe to speak on the first three point, points here. Thanks, uh, Quinique. So, you know, <laughs> it's interesting when Quinique was giving her, her opening remarks, she, she spoke to the energy that was uh, expressed by the practitioners when we came together uh, in this two-port virtual convening. And you just never know when something is planned to be in person and you convert it to virtual if you'll get the same kind of energy. But what came out of that are the practitioners, uh, including Charles and Sheldon, who uh, were uh, you know, intimately uh, participating in this, was this need to be together with one another in a peer network to establish camaraderie with other practitioners who serve young fathers in particular, uh, who were all doing things to innovate and expand the work, but also are often are doing this in isolation. And they expressed that and the nature of this work is so heavy that doing it, you know, is worrisome and, you know, they're doing it in isolation. So they really benefited from being connected with one another. And that is one of the key things that came out of this uh, this opportunity was for them to bond with one another, talk with one another, and think about how to create this expanded peer network. Uh, practitioners, express, uh, especially uh, those associated with smaller organizations, uh, they talked about the need to be able to attend professional conferences and workshops in order to continue to do uh, to develop themselves and their organizations, particularly with a focus on young fathers. Uh, some existing networks lack a focus on young fathers, and smaller fatherhood organizations uh, that focus on serving young fathers often lack the financial resources to actually attend those conferences and those workshops. So it's really important that we think about the field uh, as being critical to the development of whole families, which include dads, and what are the professional development needs of practitioners who work in this area. The second area was around uh, the design uh, of, to design research to improve program models. Practitioners identified the need to include more learning opportunities uh, to better understand the unique needs of young fathers. From young, father, from young adult brain development, which was mentioned earlier, to a culturally competent programming and curricula, something that, uh, that Sheldon uh, touched on. Service providers uh, recommended uh, the additional development of culturally re relevant curricula, as Sheldon mentioned. Uh, practitioners also identified the need to design more research, both quantitative and qualitative research, to improve program models to build evidence base. And they like to see fatherhood initiatives included in workforce and job training networks and networks that focus on boys and young men of color. This is, in, this is in, uh, particularly important because of the number of dads who come into programming uh, unemployed and severely underemployed. And the last area that I'll talk about is uh, 
around identifying and remove policies that penalize and exclude fathers. Uh, practitioners recommended a, system, a systematic analysis of policies that affect young parents, particularly young men of color who are parenting. This is needed to understand the full depth of their needs that you've heard some of and that was communicated by uh, Sheldon, uh, Charles, and myself. And here are a few examples of what uh, practitioners surface. Uh, child support orders. Uh, child support orders and payments are often established for young fathers who are often unemployed or severely underemployed, as I mentioned, uh, that they cannot pay. Orders should be set based on a young father's ability to pay. And the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement should, uh, should allow state child support agencies to use state funds uh, to provide, to pay for workforce uh, training supports uh, for young dads. And this should be a universal policy that is not required, that does not acquire, require a state to apply for a waiver. This should be a universal policy that child support offices can pay for workforce uh, supports for young dads. And in the area of criminal justice, uh, young fathers uh, of color are disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system. This experience settles young fathers with arrests and conviction records, creating huge obstacles to meaningful employment, access to education and housing. Moreover, child support obligations can continue to accrue when young fathers are incarcerated, often resulting in them being released with insurmountable debt. Uh, and that also plays back to the, the point around the Federal Office of Child Support allowing state agencies to spend resources to provide workforce supports. And then lastly, uh, in the area of uh, the TANF program, public benefits and services are important resources for young parents. However, TANF program, the TANF program struggles to meet the co-parenting needs of intact parenting couples, those couples who are together but they're poor and have limited resources and need temporary support as they think about how they're going to build their families. And for those who decide, those couples, those parenting couples who decide not to remain together and who don't have the technical capacity, don't have the community resources to learn how to negotiate an exit strategy out of a relationship that's still based on the need for them to parent for the child that they're, or children that they're responsible for. And again, I'm really encouraged that the Casey Foundation will be looking more into this area of co-parenting, particularly for young parents with an emphasis on young fathers 18 to 24. Thank you, Joe. Um, one other thing that stuck out was the collective interest of the 10 organizations to intensify and expand their services. Um, they all acknowledge that there are ways in which they are unable to serve young dads fully. For example, trauma was lifted up as the top issue faced by young fathers of color, but there are limited resources to provide mental health support. An increase in public and private funding is needed to meet this gap. The funding should be flexible and allow the organizations to address basic needs of the young dad, such as buying food and providing transportation. These are the activities that incentivize program participation. Funding should also be sustainable, allowing the organizations to focus on mental health services and legal assistance, amongst other needs. The organizations also did not hesitate to call out funders, and rightfully so. We need to be more attentive to the needs of young fathers. This includes those who support two-generation strategies, workforce and education, and young men of color. And most importantly, funding is needed to help scale promising practices across these sectors to reach young fathers. Because as we said before, their fatherhood can be a motivation, and we will only succeed in our efforts if we reach those who face the most challenges. Um, can we look to the next slide? So as we said up front, we could only cover a bit of what's in the brief in this presentation. Uh, we're now going to turn it over to you, the audience, for your questions. Uh, we, we did get uh, a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to quickly go through them and pull out some for our for our, our panelists. Um, Joe, Joe, I'm going to start with you. Joe and Charles, I'm going to start with you. Um, there was a question about the value of mentorship, um, particularly the, the communication between 18 to 24 year old dads and fathers over the age of 25. Can you two speak to that? And we'll start with uh, Charles, please. Sure. There's something about being a father or father figure that cannot be taught in the textbook, right? And I think that enhances the quality of a mentoring relationship that is necessary in every organization that is doing fatherhood. Fathers that are receiving services, participating in curriculums or evidence-based interventions 
need access to individuals that are alums who have gone through the program or community fathers that you as an organization value immensely. It's important for our fathers to have social connections outside of our organizations, right? That's when you develop, develop sustainable community. Keep in mind that many of the dads that will enter your agency may have fragmented family relationships, right? So that is a great opportunity to fill gaps by connecting them to fathers that mirror some of their similar experiences, that understand what it means to be a father, that have overcome a significant obstacle that could have kept them from being engaged in their kids' lives. All of this is essential. What you are doing is creating a surrogate family for them outside of the services that you are providing. And that in itself creates long-term stability of their mental and holistic health. I also want to make sure that we understand the importance of mentors that we are utilizing, having someone to talk to about their own problems too. What we see during COVID-19 is that many mentors are being triggered especially black and brown fathers. When you turn the news and you see black men that are being killed for no apparent reason, and then you are expecting them to be mentors to other fathers in your programs, it will be, I would say, unethical of us to not make sure that they have someone to talk to as well. Mentors need help as well. I, we call it Fathers Uplift, help for the helpers, right? While we are giving and while we are putting deposits into other people, we need to make sure that we are strategically positioning our mentors to have supports brought to them as well as someone to pour into them. Because essentially we all get empty at times from whether you're a therapist, whether you are an executive, whether you are a leader. Yes, mentorship is important, but our mentors need help too. So while you're trying to find wonderful mentoring models, please do not forget to make sure that your mentors have someone to pour into them as well. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. I'm gonna follow up with a, a Sorry, I'm gonna oppose the next question to Sheldon. Um, Sheldon, we received some um, questions about um, targeted outreach and recruitment, particularly how do you identify young fathers um, um, who are not connected to school or existing programs? Uh, what specific strategies do you recommend? That's an excellent question for whoever asked. So the Dovetail Project is not a referral-based fatherhood initiative. All of our young men are 80%, 100%, recruited, and the other 20% have, may have been suggested or referred by our alumni, and that's who we lean on when we're doing recruitment around working with our young fathers. But just engagement in the community in general, our outreach team is on the ground, and we're walking up to any individual we see and asking them, hey, are you a father? Do you need a job, a GED, or a trade? Um, yeah, okay, well, you need to go online and fill out the application. And so it's just as simple as that. It's, you know, it's not anything that we're using um, except just walking up to the young men and making sure that our hook and pitch is right. And oftentimes when you're speaking to young men, particularly young men of color, and it, you can't just say, hey, I got a fatherhood program, come out. It doesn't work like that. You have to be able to walk up to the young men and say, hey, are you a dad? Do you know of any other fathers? Yeah, I, I have a few friends. Okay, do you need a job, a GD, or a trade? That is the resource ask. So once you make the resource ask, it catches that young person's attention. Yeah, where can I get that from? Go online to the website, sign up, and someone will reach out to you to bring you in for orientation. And so that's how our process works and operate, and that's what we use on the ground anytime we're interacting with young men around recruitment. Thank you, Sheldon. I'm going to throw a question to Joe um, regarding supporting young dads in the environment of COVID-19. Uh, we, we know from some data that uh, connectivity, internet connectivity is a, is a huge challenge. Um, did your organization equip, um, how did your organization decide the connectivity and the um, technology needs of young fathers? And did you tap into any resources to help um, merge that gap? Yeah, you know, so COVID, you know, obviously, as we all are now working remotely, and for practitioners who are working with young dads, we want to maintain the support that we uh, we provided uh, pre-COVID, uh, but that means we've had to make this adjustment to a virtual environment. And just about all of our young dads have access to uh, some form of a cell phone, but often don't have the monetary resources to maintain the kind of plans that will allow them to connect 
virtually. So we have to make adjustments to make sure that from a monetary standpoint, we can support that. But it's also about, you know, it's one thing to have a smartphone and to use it for general purposes. But when you talk about engaging people virtually in a support group, you know, a support group uh, manner, it's also teaching them how to use the functions. And so you have to spend some extra time with individuals just helping them to get acclimated to it. Also thinking about, you know, areas where they can, uh, they can get uh, remote access uh, that doesn't cost them. And, you know, it really is about this, this, this intimate engagement that helps young fathers to understand you, we are still here for you. Uh, we are still going to be engaging you. We're going to be making those touches. Uh, we're going to be reaching out to you on a regular basis. And most of all, to say to them, if you find yourself in a situation where you and or your children and family are meeting or uh, are, are reaching a, a point where things are just getting too stressful, you're about to be uh, become evicted, you need to reach out to us if we don't catch you in between. It's making sure that folks know that in this COVID environment, we still have your back the same way that we had your back uh, prior to COVID. Uh, it's just that we have to operate in a remote, safe, safe <laughs> uh, social distancing way. Thank you, Joe. Charles, we received a question about the challenges or barriers, um, about what challenges or barriers that you encountered um, when trying to recruit young dads in a clinical approach. Um, can you share a little bit, bit on that with the audience? Sure, I can tell you, and I'm so happy that you asked this question, whoever posted. it. Um, I can tell you that one of the greatest challenges to recruiting fathers is getting them to have buy-in into what it is that you are doing. Now, what they are wrestling with is many preconceived notions about what it is that you are going to do for them and how you will utilize them, right? So they already have associated you to a negative perception of a system that they have worked with in the past. If you are in a clinical setting, they're already comparing you to their last clinician. If you are in a curriculum setting, they're already comparing you to a curriculum that they've already gone through, right? So before they even get through the door, they're looking at you, how are you going to be different and what are you going to do different for them, right? Oftentimes, I can tell you that there's an automatic association, especially for services such as mental health services, uh, medical services, there's an automatic association of I am afraid to utilize these services because of what has done, what has been done to my people and also what has been done to me. Many of the dads that fall into the black and brown category know their history, right? So they may not have gone to college, but they can tell you about their history, right? Some of them may have, some of them may have not, but we want to be mindful that you are already being lumped in the category against another person, another situation, and you are tasked with proving them differently, that you are not just utilizing them to get your numbers up or for data points or for a service that you genuinely care about them. And that has been the most, I would say, challenging portion of recruiting is to show these dads who've already gone through several services before they touched us that we genuinely care about them, that they're more than a data point, they're more than a completion certificate, they are more than just a note in my um, online medical record system, they're a part of the family. So I think much of the work around making sure that your environment is a father friendly, that you are generally showing your authentic self, self-disclosing when necessary, and making sure that you are not putting yourself in the category of the other, right, is very important when you are recruit, recruiting fathers. If, in fact, you are not acknowledging their previous experiences or taking into consideration that you're automatically being compared against another group of people, if you fail to acknowledge that, right, it will be difficult for you to get fathers engaged in your program. Organically, we have between 60 to 80 new father recruits a month, right? Because fathers, when they walk through our door, know that we care. Culturally, they know that we care. They know when they talk to one of our clinicians or they talk to someone on our team, that we're going to let them know, hey, man, this is bigger than us just trying to get you through our program. We generally are investing in making sure that you stay connected to your kids, and we will do anything by any means necessary. That's the type of attitude that you have to have when you're dealing with a challenge as big as the one that all of us deal with, right? Remember, you are not the first program that they are talking to or the first person that they have talked to about a service that you are offering. So thank you, Cornique, for that question. Thank you, Charles. So we had a question about, um, come through about co-parenting, particularly how do you um, help the young father navigate co-parenting, especially if the relationship with the mother has um, evolved into a, a sort of strenuous or a challenging relationship? as well as how do you acknowledge um, extended family members? And I'm gonna ask that Joe um, respond to this question.
Joe, I think you're on mute. Yeah, thank you, Quinny. Uh, we, you know, we're talking about young parents uh, who are also in a stage where they are, they're still developing, their brains are still developing, and that's what the science tells us. Uh, but we also know that they deeply care, but the relationships are often complex, and they're trying to, and oftentimes they're trying to figure out the challenges of a relationship and parenting simultaneously and doing it on their own. Uh, so the one thing that we uh, we really focus on is letting them tell their story. Uh, as we talked before, building the trust with them so you began to hear more and more and about their ability to open up and share with you. But also it's important not to take sides, right? Not to take sides with the dad, not to take sides with the mom, but just to listen. And many fatherhood programs don't also provide services to the mom. So that means you're hearing one side of the story. And mediation services, as we begin to build this competency in the field around co-parenting, mediation services are an important tool and resource uh, to engage as a partner uh, to help young parents and families work through the challenges of uh, managing a relationship and their, um, their uh, parental responsibilities uh, simultaneously. And I'll add that, you know, many of our young fathers, uh, they express not having meaningful, consistent, in some cases, they don't even know their own fathers. So their definition of manhood is being shaped by forces that don't come from their biological lineage, if you will. And so helping them to understand that, you know, this space that you feel, this identity void that you feel, uh, it's not normal, but in this group, in this fatherhood work that we're doing, in this, in, in this camaraderie that we're building, you are not alone. And so it's really important. And if you think about the image of this young father on the, on the report cover, you know, you think about what we are collectively doing with our interest in this webinar, how we are pouring into him and how what we pour into him extends to what he's now pouring into his daughter. And when you look at the face of that young father and that two-year-old baby, you can't help but think about the promise of this work. Thank you, Joe. Sheldon, I'm going to throw the possibly the last question to you, um, and I, I will acknowledge that it might be the, one of the tougher questions. Um, they're all good questions, but this is definitely a, a tough one. Um, how do you balance the financial responsibility to care for your children and the various employment uh, and workforce development? Repeat the question. How do you balance financial responsibility to care for the child and the various employment and workforce development? With, with young fathers, is that yes. so? The young the, the question is is for young fathers. For young fathers, how do you balance their financial responsibilities to care for the child while addressing their employment and workforce development? That sounds yeah, it is a difficult question because it's it's everywhere. Um, yeah, and I don't usually get stuck on questions. <laughs> And I'm going to invite our other panelists uh, to jump in. No, so, yeah, can, repeat the question for me one more time. So I, I think this question is getting to, you know, this, it, it's sort of a, you, you know, you're engaging the young father around both his um, parenting responsibilities as well as acknowledging his, his workforce needs. So, you know, in a sense, he needs to work immediately, but you also need to uh, address um, the the programming behind it, have them go through the programming and um, uh, identify, work through some other issues at the same time. Yeah, so, so, for, uh, so for us, we're all about meeting our fathers where we're at. That's number one. Number two, no, no, there's no map or manual to parenting, right? So it's, it's, it's no perfect way to go about one or the other, right? The goal of parenting is to is to be a parent, which is to do the best that you possibly can all across the board. I don't, and now that you've explained that question, I don't think it's a difficult question. I think it, I think that's a difficult way of looking at a young parent, particularly a young father. And, and really, you know, and really what we really need to understand is that these are young people that are between the ages of 17 to 24 who are underdeveloped, who are looking to find their way, and their parents might not have had a been in, in their lives. And so, to, to look at one and say, hey, you're doing this and not that, or you're doing this and, and this isn't going, you, you want to look at everything collectively and say, hey, is this young man stepping up? To, is he stepping up? That's the first step. Is he stepping up, right? And and while he's stepping up, the, the, the pieces he will learn from us, and then there's things he won't learn from us. How do he take it all 
and put it all together to continue to move forward. And so that's that's how I would answer that question. And I apologize, but that was a difficult one. Thank you for the heads up. <laughs> you know, we started by saying it was a difficult one, but no, as, as you responded, you you hit the you hit the question on the head. It, it was it, it they are that complex individuals, and when you take them into their whole consideration, then it's not as difficult as we might first suspect. Um, I know that I opened it up to the panelists, so, so I do want to see. I, and I saw that Joe unmuted himself, so I did want to give him a, a minute or so to jump in with another with um, additional thoughts. You, you know, we live in a capitalistic society, and we can't, you know, we can't nibble around the edges on a question like this is very complex. And we know that in order for you to contribute to your child, that includes financial contributions. But for young fathers and young fathers of color who are disproportionately connected to all kind of adverse systems uh, that don't necessarily speak to their strengths, it makes it incredibly difficult for them to contribute financially. So, and also, you know, balancing against the needs of what you may want to do with them programmatically. And so sometimes it means you have to be flexible enough that if there's a curriculum group, as an example, that on one day that person can't make it because he works, then you, you do some adaptations where you work, the, you know, the case management or the curriculum uh, facilitator can work with him one-on-one -on -one to make up sessions, right? That's the kind of flexibility, but also to do things to make sure that they have financial resources uh, that are flexible enough so that he can do things with his child or with his children. And there's no be more beautiful picture than when we do father-child outing, and particularly when we take them to purchase clothes for back to school, and he has the resource to be able to purchase those items for his child. His child is with him, seeing him buy, uh, buying those items, and the look between those two, that bond, that, that sense of, that's my dad being here, being, for, being here for me now, are the kind of images that we want to create over and over. And fatherhood is a way that we can do that. And that's why I think it's really important that we've come together for this project uh, to really underscore the need for young fathers and the practitioners who work very hard to serve them. Thank you, Joe. Um, both you and Sheldon, I appreciate your response. And I think that was the perfect transition to help us close out this uh, webinar. Um, if we can move to the next slide. So as we close out, I'd like to share a few upcoming projects focused on young fathers. Um, first, the Casey Foundation is launching United for Young Fathers this upcoming fall. Um, this is a space designed for practitioners and will allow them to continue exploring challenges they are facing and promising innovation. Um, our hope is also that these practices will be embedded, adapted, and scaled to advance opportunity for all young fathers of color. Um, my colleague, Allison Holmes, is also launching a study on co-parenting network. Um, this research will survey young fathers across the country to understand how their family and friends influence their ability to, to successfully parent. It also aims to understand how programs currently address fathers' co-parenting needs. Um, Allison's email is listed on the slide if you'd like to learn more about this project. Um, next slide. We would also like to share some final resources on what we know about serving young parents overall. Um, these resources can be accessed through the KC website. Um, we also include a link to the new CFUF report, which is active on their website today. Next slide. And as we come to the end of this webinar, I want to thank our panelists um, for um, the time and commitment that you've given to this discussion, as well as the passion and thoughtfulness in your responses. I think it was really appreciated um, in the eyes of the, the audience. Um, I'd also like to thank the organizations who participated in the spring roundtable, um, where many of them um, are tuned in with us. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that you know, the, knowledge, the knowledge and best practices you shared with us was very much appreciated, and we look forward to the continued work on this. Um, most importantly, I want to thank all of you who joined today's webinar. We hope you leave with ideas, challenges, or action items for how you can better engage and serve young fathers in your hometown. If you'd like to learn more about the models featured here, our panelists have graciously shared their email contacts. So if you would like to follow up more with them, uh, feel free to reach out via email. Thank you and cheers for now.